Right muckers. So the Ford 8100. A lot of you already seen that on Facebook and Instagram. And you know, a lot of people said it's great that I found one. Uh, why did I want one? You know, why the 81? To go back 30 odd years ago, I was lucky enough, I suppose, was lucky uh, to drive an 8100 uh, two wheel drive. Uh, can't a bit of soil and stone uh, for a couple of months. And back then, when you're young and impressionable, you know, I thought it was an incredible tractor, you know, sort of big two wheel drive tractor, lots of noise, lots of smoke. Um, and it went like off a shovel, you know, up the road. Fast forward 30 odd years, uh, and I've been looking for one over the years, where's when they come up, but because most of them have been used and abused, and there weren't that many of them made in the first place, they're quite rare. So to find a decent one, they just don't come up, and when they do, they're making mega money, uh, because, you know, people, like them because they're rare, they look nice and whatever. Uh, and the other thing obviously is that they were built by county. So I got the chance, found one that um, mechanically is decent enough, wants a few things done to it, not a problem. But the tin work was good, engine and transmission was good. The main thing is the cab was solid. Uh, it's a really good cab on it. Um, so I thought, well, I've got to have this one. It's either this one or not probably not going to get another chance. So I got it. So we're going to have to say, look at, um, in the next few months, I'm going to be doing bits on it, uh, repairs, and fabrication stuff. Uh, it's not going to be a restoration, I'm not going to strip it right back down. It's just going to be basically an overhaul, uh, a light renovation overhaul. Stuff that needs doing will be done. But the thing itself runs and drives really, really well. But a bit about the history of the 8100s and how they came about because they're a bit of a hodgepodge of a tractor really. Now today if you wanted a 110, 115 horsepower tractor you'd go to your dealer and you'd say yeah I want one of them, a nice I'd line up to be a 6 cylinder, 115 horsepower, four wheel drive, I want these spills, this seat, I want this transmission, I want back in the mid 70s that just wasn't the case. Your average farm tractor was about 60 70 horsepower and two wheel drive and ford uh had their range and that sort of basically topped off uh but just over 100 horsepower with the 76 and the flat cab version the sort of deluxe version was the 7 700 um force on the turbo but then there was this big gap up to the next range which was then the 8 700 about 128 horsepower and then the 9 700 153. So there was a big gap and these tractors were like the forerunners of the TW so they were fairly cumbersome and you know, your average farmer said look you know 7700 is absolutely fantastic for us year in you know year out all the way round. I can play with it, I can go drilling with it, use it around the yard every day. Come silage time on some of the steeper ground and the hillier ground uh, you know, we want to drive a trailed forager uh, and then when we're opening up now we want to pull a trailer as well. You'd hook a trailer on the back of the trail forager so not only were you, you know, pulling the forager, you were pulling the trailer that you were loading yourself. And it just doesn't have that sort of hang, it doesn't have that sort of low down torque and grunt. We could do the bit more horsepower. Ideally, we'd like something, a six cylinder, you know, and the dealer would say, well, you know, there's the 8, 700, that's just a too big a jump we don't need something that big you know most of the year it would be parked up it's just too big for us what we want is something that's got a bit more grunt and low down torque a six cylinder 115 horsepower and Ford didn't produce anything but you could go to the likes of County Muir Hill and Roadless and uh, you could say to them look I want a 115 horsepower track, six on it, and they would produce some. So, what happened then was Ford uh, spoke to EVA in Belgium, who are another conversion company. They had been producing 7,000s with six on the engines. The thing is, the six on the engine around that horsepower, uh, below the likes, you know, the later 401 and whatever, uh, was an unstressed engine, meaning that, like a lot of modern tractors, 
Uh, you've got your back end, your transmission, you've got your front end tombstone and weights and front axle, and the two pieces are bolted front and rear to the engine, and the engine itself is designed that the block takes the stress, so it's all one. Well, the engine that Ford had available at the time was a very, very good engine. And they, Ford had used this in, you know, marine applications, industrial compressors and generators, um, various plant and machinery, but more so in their um, series of trucks, the D-series, the Ford D-series trucks, um, which were, you know, in the day, a decent wagon, um, and it was known as the Dorset. These were like an industrial and commercial spec engine, and they were just a, a better engine all round, really. Well, you got your seat, the spinning mixed pump, and then the actual injectors in the head, that way, rather than being in the top, as in the agricultural type, as you say, these are straight inside of the head. But the thing is that had chassis rails, obviously, because it was a truck. So the engine was mounted in the chassis rails, uh, so there's no stress on it. So Ford had to overcome this, and EVA said, that's not a problem. Look, what we would do is produce um, a carrier, a bathtub almost. It did look like a big, heavy bathtub. And this is that big bathtub. You can see the whole thing from here one big casting to here. And that gives the strength from this back end here, the gearbox and transmission housing, to the front tombstone where the front axle's mounted. Because there's no actual strength in the actual block itself. Not on these type of engines. The sump fits through the bottom, through the hole in the bottom there. Brilliant, said Ford, that's great. Right, so. We've got an engine, we've got a way to mount it, we've got the back ends off the 6.7 and the 7.700 range. The back end is pretty standard Ford Fair. This, as I said, is the same back end as the 7.700 range. Uh, you've got an assist around there. This one's got a pickup hitch. Um, got your spools there and whatever, and your electric uh, socket, 7-pin socket. But this is all pretty standard stuff. We can't produce that. We don't have the capacity at the factory of Haslam. So what they did is they asked County to make it for them. And County said, yeah, we'd do it. But it's almost like shooting themselves in the foot because before, the customers said, well, we can't get a six on 115 horsepower from Ford. We went to the likes of, you know, as I said, Muirhill, Roadless, and County. So County then started producing a tractor for Ford in competition for their own stuff. But that's just how things are, you know, it's a progress. And the right had been on the wall, I think, for a while, really, for the likes of County, because the big manufacturers soon catch up to the fact that why should we give, you know, just a skid unit, get money for a, a transmission and an engine when we can get money for the complete unit, you know. So anyway, County produced the 8100, but if you wanted a four wheel drive, version and you could have one but not from direct from Ford you still had to get your dealer to get the Schindler axle conversion kit and then they went on to produce the 8200 which you could then order direct from your dealer in a choice of two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive and then the next step, step for that for the 8200 you know became the 8210 that we all know and then the 9.7 and the 8.700, well, they became the TW10, 20 and 30, which again became the TW15, 25 and the 35. That's a whole other story. But that's how the 8100 uh, came into being. As I said, it was, it was something that was born a necessity, really, and, and a, a need and desire uh, by the customer for having a six cylinder, 115 horsepower tractor that could you know, drive something, um, and, but still be usable around the farm throughout the year on a lot of applications and operations.
Now, the photos you've seen as I was telling you about how the, uh, the sort of evolution of the 18100 came about uh, was sent to me uh, very kindly by uh, Stephen Richmond and Jonathan Whitman from Tractor Barn Productions. I'm sure most of you have heard of them. Now they got this wonderful book which I've used for a lot of reference and stuff. Um, and it's just a fantastic book to see because it's all about forward conversions. I mean, starting with right early stuff and, you know, all sorts in there. Roadless and counties and Muir Hills and Brays and all sorts. Tons and tons of stuff. Absolutely fantastic. Just crammed back with that. Right up to, you know, like the small, more modern 60 series and things like that that you know, Ford have produced. Roadlesses and whatever. And what I'll do is I'll put a uh, link in the description and at the end here so you can go and have a look at the stuff they've got. They've got, say, no end of really, really good books and DVDs and stuff like that and a couple of good old boys. So, but thank you for that, uh, lads, because that is much appreciated. It makes things a lot easier when you try to describe what an 8700 looks like and, you know. Um, talking of making things easier, I've been filming everything as I've been doing on the 8100 because I've made a start um, a couple of three weeks ago now. And the first thing I've started on was the seat. And I want to keep the original Bostrom seat. Uh, people say, well, you just get a modern one. You can just whip it. Yeah, you can do, but I, you know, the seat itself isn't that bad. Um, the cushions aren't great. You can get that all rear pulse, that's not a problem. That'll be a sort of part two of the seat rebuild. Part one is the suspension, the bottom end where all levers and cantilevers and stuff like that. We have more bushes made up. They're not plastic bushes like the modern ones. These are all steel bushes with a phosphor bronze bush insert inside. So we're having them machined up, we've been doing other bits, but I've been filming it all. And that's what I want to do. As I go along, um, you know, some are a bit more detailed, some will be a bit more simple, um, you know, just easy stuff, a bit of fabrication, that. But the main thing is I want to try and demonstrate to you all that you haven't got to have a sort of like a mega, you know, all kitted out workshop to do this sort of stuff. It's stuff that, you know, if you've got half a brain cell, and I think most of us have, well, a few of us have, you can do this stuff at home or in the farm workshop. And like I said, this isn't going to be a restoration. This isn't going to be, you know, stripped down, nothing but there's no point in it. This tractor is all together. It's solid. It just wants a few jobs done. It's going to be like an overhaul, not a restoration, just an overhaul. Get it, you know, keeping its work and clothes, get it up and run so everything's bang on. So there we are. Um, so the first thing is the seat. Get that done, that'll be the first sort of video I do. Uh, I'll show you, hopefully I can get the bits back for that this week. They should be back here and I'll show you, I'll rebuild the seat back up. Right, I'm gonna crack on. And uh, as I said, I hope that gave you a little bit of an insight into the 8100. And you know, uh, you'll be able to see it a bit more in detail as we go along. Um, Cause there'll be plenty to look at and I'll explain stuff as I'm going. And you know, it's, uh, it's good to, you know, have you guys there to, to see it all happening, really. Um, so there we are. Right. Do well.